ladies and gentlemen, uh, and thanks for joining this lunchtime seminar organized by the second Young Member Subcommittee Group. Before starting, it's my duty to inform you that the meeting is recorded. Therefore, please turn your microphones and cameras off to avoid background noise. Questions will be kept for the end of the seminar when you will have the chance to either unmute yourself or write them in the chat box and I can read them aloud for you. I will leave my email address in the chat box as well in case you want to have the recording sent to you. So today we have the honor and pleasure to host Dr. Jamal Dadik from the EU Center Foundation, Dr. Alejandro Calderon and Dr. Vitor Silva from GEM, who will address some of the current and future challenges related to the topic of seismic risk assessment. Jamal is currently a seismic risk engineer working for, on the RISE project, Real-Time Earthquake Risk Reduction for a Resilient Europe. He holds, a P, he holds a PhD from the Institute of for Advanced Studies in Pavia, with a thesis entitled Assessment and Mitigation of Earthquake and Flood Risks, focused on the Middle East region. He will be talking about the Fellowship of Risk Assessment, illustrating a workflow for testing the sensitivity of risk estimates to the spatial resolution of exposure data for European countries. Alejandro joined the risk team of GEM, Global Earthquake Model, as physical risk engineer. He is currently involved in the implementation of the GEM and USAID OFDA project, training and communication for earthquake risk assessment in Quito, Ecuador, and Cali, Colombia. He holds a PhD with the title Towards a Uniform Earthquake Loss Model Across Central America in the Risk and Emergency Management Program of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Pavia. Alejandro also interned with GEM as part of his PhD program and contributed to GEM projects in Central America. He will cover the second part of this seminar, presenting how risk assessment can consider the dynamic drivers such as people, structures, and systems in our urban environment in order to provide effective long-term information to support mitigation strategies for today and tomorrow. Finally, Vitor is the Seismic Risk Team Coordinator at the Global Earthquake Model GEM Foundation. He has participated in studies in structural vulnerability and probability seismic risk assessment in dozens of countries such as Portugal, Iran, Peru, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Canada. He is currently leading or participating in international programs supported by the Global Facility for Disaster Risk Reduction and Recovery of the World Bank, the European Commission, and the United States Agency for International Development. He is a worldwide renowned researcher serving as an associate editor for Earthquake Spectra and as a member of the executive committee of the World Housing Encyclopedia. He will conclude the seminar discussing the return of the urban risk, providing a global urban risk indicator for the vulnerability classification using high risk, high resolution satellite imagery. And now, without further ado, I leave the floor to Jamal. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Valentina and Fiona, for the invitation and for organizing this webinar. In today's presentation, we will talk about some of the challenges in seismic risk assessment. Valentina already um, already covered uh, the topics that we will talk about. Uh, basically, I will start with a brief uh, uh, brief introduction about seismic risk. Bas I will present uh, a sensitivity analysis on the spatial resolution of exposure data using um, case studies from the new European seismic risk model. Alejandro will continue talking about future project projections of exposure and risk models. 
apply to Europe. And finally, we'll, uh, Vitor will present uh, a global seismic risk index for more than 4,000 uh, urban centers around the world. Although 30 years is a relatively short period of time, uh, in the same period, natural disasters cause death almost in every country. That being said, assessing and understanding disaster risk using reliable sources of information is really the backbone that can support uh, risk reduction in the present and also for the future generations. Probably most of you know, uh, risk is the overlap between uh, exposure, vulnerability and hazard. When these components are combined, uh, the outcomes usually helps us to understand where do we have risk and how much it costs as a result of the damage to the physical environment, but also to uh, in terms of human costs. This information could also help us identify, for example, the structure that drive risk and ultimately find solutions uh, to, to strengthen them. So what are exposure models? In case we want to study buildings, exposure models typically define buildings numbers, their economic value and the geographical distribution uh, within an area of interest. And there are many ways to model them. Ideally, we want to have building by building information. However, collecting information at the building level for a country or a continent uh, needs a lot of resources. OpenStreetMap is a great example for crowdsourced information at the building level that can really scale to cities and even countries. However, uh, this recent study, for example, showed that only 30% of the buildings in the developed regions are mapped. Those account for 50% of the world population. Besides that, the information available does not tell us uh, many things about the buildings in these regions. So the data is really uh, incomplete, but it has a great uh, potential to in the future for, uh, for exposure models at the national scale. Because we often don't have information about every building, we use usually public information that is typically aggregated. An example of this is the European model for Europe, which shows here the distribution of uh, buildings replacement value by material at the country level. This type of models are uh, developed primarily using um, national census and information about the common construction, which is taken from the housing reports and through uh, many experts workshops. This is the commercial exposure uh, at the highest spatial resolution available from public data for Europe. And as you can see, the level of detail vary from country to another. For example, compare Spain and uh, Italy. But why spatial resolution is relevant? Uh, suppose we want to estimate damage at a location due to a seismic event. The ground shaking below the structure will be dependent on the distance between the source and the building and the local site conditions underneath that building. Not knowing uh, the exact position of the building can bias the ground shaking at that location, which could underestimate or overestimate the damage at that location. Now, in the case of building portfolio with millions of assets, we tend to use the geometrical centroid of the region represented by the blue symbol uh, just because we don't know the exact locations. However, as you can see, the centroid can be quite distant from the real locations of the buildings uh, represented by the cross symbol, which is basically the city in that region in Turkey. As part of the testing activities for the 2020 European seismic risk, we wanted to test the influence of exposure resolution on on the model through a sensitivity analysis. And so for each of the 35 European countries considered, we simulated about 18 test cases with different uh, resolution and site configurations. For example, here, instead of using the centroid of the region in the left figure, we experimented the weighted average centroid uh, presented by the green squares, the maximum density location represented by the blue circle, which is typically the city with the most with the highest density of population, 
and the uh, median uh, density location, the, which is the red triangle. This weighting process was done using the human settlement density map uh, from the Joint European Centre GRC. Another common way to improve the resolution is to, re is to relocate uh, buildings from the centroid of the region to a regular grid of points based on the density of the settlements or sometimes the population or the nighttime lights. There are many other proxies that are used to distribute buildings. In this case, we disaggregated and we um, considered six resolution ranging from one kilometer by one kilometer to 30 by 30 kilometers. For the hazard component, we used the 2013 uh, source model for Europe and the 2020 site amplification model, which uses the surface geology and topographic uh, slope as a direct uh, function for the site amplification. In the same manner, we use different techniques to assign sign properties needed for the site amplification model. For example, the figure shows the average shear wave velocity at the second administrative level in Greece, estimated with different weighting methods. And as you can see, the different methods give quite different output. In this case, using, using the uh, VS30 uh, at the geometric centroid appears to underestimate side amplification in this region and so the loss. For the vulnerability component, the European vulnerability model uses the GEMS vulnerability database, except for the reinforced concrete um, frame and infill frames. For the concrete building, uh, for, this, uh, for this group of buildings, both the code level and the lateral uh, force coefficient were used to better model the vulnerability in this region. This was done by studying the temporal and spatial evolution of uh, seismic design across Europe between 1910 and 2000. We calculated a uh, risk by integrating exposure models in open quake engine and use the event based calculator to estimate portfolio average annual loss and the losses for specific return periods. Results. So how does spatial resolution affect risk at the national scale? This graph shows the relationship between resolution of the administrative boundary and the change in the loss as a percentage relative to the benchmark model which was here the one kilometer by one kilometer grid exposure. Of course, the lower the resolution, uh, the higher the bias, the loss. For example, using the first administrative level uh, in Belgium, underestimated the loss by almost 60%. If we are interested in estimating the average annual loss, for example, at the subnational level, for, which could be region, a province or municipality, the figures show that at the region level, for example, we can expect a bias in the loss up to 80%, which is higher than if we look at the average annual loss at the national level. One common question when using aggregated exposure is where should we place buildings? Based on the samples analyzed here, we found that uh, using the density weighted average location and site condition, had the lowest bias when compared to the other methods. This, slides, uh, this slide shows you the disaggregated, uh, the, the, um, the disaggregate, disaggregating exposure can really minimize the bias associated uh, with low resolution models. We found that um, the range from two to eight kilometers provides a reasonable level of accuracy uh, and in a reasonable amount of time. Um, one main reason for lower losses uh, observed throughout the study is that when buildings are aggregated in one location, not that many events will affect the portfolio that would otherwise if they were more realistically distributed. Beside the average annual loss, sometimes we want to estimate losses for a specific return period. We noticed that the insufficient spatial resolution could overestimate losses significantly, especially for higher return periods. Take, for example, Italy, the 1000 uh, year event. To conclude this part, exposure spatial resolution has 
a significant impact on probabilistic seismic risk. Using density weighted average location is recommended when using administrative exposure models. Disaggregating exposure between uh, two to eight kilometers seem to provide reasonable, a reasonable trade-off between accuracy and computational demand. This should be taken though with a grain of salt. The recommended resolution could vary based on the risk metric presented, the aggregation level, and, country, and the country considered. And of course, the underlying, uh, underlying uh, components of risk. Location uncertainty should be neglected, shouldn't be neglected when assessing seismic risk. Risk models uh, should incorporate a sensitivity check when dealing with exposure models with uh, low spatial resolution. The tools, uh, the tools needed to construct a similar sensitivity study or even um, similar exposure and site models are available and are free to use in the links shown below. Thank you for your attention. Uh, back to you, Alejandro, for the second part. Thank you very much, Jamal, for such a nice presentation. Um, can you listen to me? Yeah, I hear you clearly. Perfect. So, hello, everyone. I am Alejandro. Um, I would like to segue this topic with, uh, with uh, our second chapter, which is entitled uh, The Two Times, Present and Future. We can go to the next slide. So it is often said that when we are doing risk estimations, we are taking a picture in time. We saw in Jamal's presentation how even that picture itself can be far from ideal. So we go to incredible lengths to try to understand risk as reliable as possible. Now to, take, to make things even more challenging, at GM we're also asking ourselves if those current estimates are enough to propose effective risk mitigation strategies. And uh, take a look at these three cities that I am showing in this, in this slide. We have Budapest, Medellin, and Lagos. And the first one is in a country with a steady population decline. The second one and the third one are in countries of a steady population increase. However, these three urban centers have one thing in common, and it is that they are all changing. Maybe at different rates, true, but our man-made environment is not static. It is actually continuously expanding. So if we go to the next slide, Jamal. Here, I want to show you that it is not just expanding, but we are also changing what the environment is made of. Uh, and in my home country of Costa Rica, in the last five decades, you can see here that we have completely abandoned adobe construction. We have significantly decreased our wood as a construction material. And now most of our cities are made of reinforced masonry. We have even introduced new construction technologies, like the use of the precast concrete into our, into our buildings. Um, we can go to the next slide. So if our cities, our urban centers are expanding and their physical properties are changing in major ways, it is not so hard to imagine risk as a dynamic thing. And we can take a picture of it at present but it is moving, and most importantly, if we wanna change its trajectory, we have to understand that it has a certain inertia to it. It's being driven by something. In this image, this is exactly what I want to show. We have a point representing our current risk estimate. Uh, let's say the average annual economic loss in, in a city. But this risk has this natural baseline trajectory into the future. Now, our risk mitigation strategies should be aimed at influencing that trajectory, and we could evaluate their effectiveness by how much they lower the risk towards a given set target. Uh, this is what these other two lines represent. One can represent a certain mitigation strategy, and the second one, another mitigation strategy. And uh, to use a target as an example, we can say that that target can be a target set by the same, by the Sendai framework, let's say. Um, we can go to the next slide. So at GEM, we have dedicated some time into thinking, how can we complement our present photo of risk with, a, with an educated guess about the trajectory of that risk for the forthcoming decades? And we establish our objective, which is to be able to develop urban growth models capable of forecasting exposure for the next four decades. And we want those models to account for uh, 
time dependent variables, of course, like the future number of occupants and structures, their possible geographical location, but even better to be able to consider uncertainties associated to those assumptions in our models. Um, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so our first step in the process is to look at the past to understand the present. And in this step of our methodology, we take a set of remote sensing data sets that can tell us how the environment has changed over the years. As an example here, I am showing the global, the global human settlements data set for the great metro area of Costa Rica, which has captured how this region has expanded over time. And keep in mind that we can examine this process at an urban scale like the city or at a national scale for a country. We can go to the next slide. Then we select a number of natural and man-made environmental factors that we suspect were important drivers of that urban growth in the past. Among the natural drivers, we can have uh, terrain topography or the availability of water bodies, but we can also have man-made drivers um, like the presence of main roads or networks or the proximity to the main urban centers. In our analysis, we include uh, from six to 10 different drivers, depending on the geographical state scale we're working on. Here I am showing the weight of those drivers at an urban and a national scale. Um, the, the figure in the left is for the great metro area of Costa Rica, and the figure in the right will be for the national territory of Ireland. By weight, I mean that for every unconstructed area of land, we have estimated how close that piece of land east to a main city, east to a main road network, et cetera, et cetera. We can go to the next slide. So this looking at the past allows us to do a geographical weighted regression. In other words, we can estimate two things. First, which drivers were determinant in the growth of our urban centers? And second, how likely it is that the current available land will be developed in the future? Here I am showing you the results of such regression and how it looks for the great metro area of Costa Rica. And that will be an example of an urban application, but also the regression at a national level for the national territory of Germany. We can go to the next slide. So from here, we have some options. If we have that probability of transition, then we can do simple Monte Carlo simulations based on those probabilities. That way we can create several scenarios to represent the future built environment. Now I'm going to focus on this option first. The advantages of this is that you can still consider epistemic and aleatory uncertainties in the process. And it, uh, it can also, you can also scale it easily. You can also do this at a big geographical scale. And if we see in the next slide, area for the European Union. This simulation considered time-dependent variables like the fertility rate, the life expectancy, the net migration, even the expected GDP growth of each individual country in the region. And this allowed us to do this simulation. In the next slide, once we have these simulations of future growth, what can we do with that, with those kind of scenarios? Well, if we have knowledge about the current built environment in a country, then we can transform that future area into new residential buildings, schools, hospitals, etc. For example, in this map, I'm showing a scenario of rapid growth for Turkey, where the future buildings are being, that are being added in, in the region of Istanbul or Ankara have the same characteristics that we can find in the present buildings in those areas. We can go into the next slide. Thank you. We also have another option. Uh, if our regression tells us that the drivers of growth are dynamic in nature, for example, the proximity to cities uh, is more important than the topography of, as, 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 as a driver of urban growth, then we can also consider more elaborate approaches. In GEM, we have been able to apply uh, multiple agent systems, or MAS for short, to make simulations of urban growth. We can go to the next slide. Mass models can simulate our urban environment. Uh, these environments are populated with agents that can be programmed to make decisions based on what is most convenient to them. 
In this slide, I am showing a mass simulation for El Salvador, which is a small country. There are invisible agents randomly traveling through the landscape. And everywhere they evaluate a piece of land, if a piece of land is worth developing or not. And in the process, they take into consideration those dynamic factors that I was talking about. So how close I am to certain amenities, how rapidly this piece of land is being developed uh, by other agents and so on. And so when they make a decision to settle, we can capture that change and that densification of the environment. You can go to the next slide. In this way, we simulate uh, not only the expansion of the urban environment, but we can also simulate how dense it gets. And the simulating urban density is actually a, a very nice feature because we can infer how the new buildings will most likely be or belong to high-rise building structures instead of low-rise building structures. So again, this all results in an exposure model that can tell us which regions have the most potential to grow in the future. We can go to the next slide. So just to finish, the big question is how can we use this? Well, this type of analysis can help us identify regions of fast changing exposure and hence fast changing risk. Here I am showing you the, proje the projection of the Sendai indicator A1 for several municipalities in the Dominican Republic. Now the indicator A1 is the average annual fatalities per 10,000 inhabitants. So therefore um, it is a seismic risk, risk metric per se. You can see that uh, in some regions we have slow changing trajectories. For example, this is the case of the capital of Santo Domingo. Other regions, like the city of Santiago in the north, show a steady increase in risk. And this can be due to the land availability in the municipality, fast changing population, and a higher rates of informal construction in Santiago in comparison, in comparison with other cities in the country. Um, we can go to the next slide. And so with this, we can propose and test mitigation strategies. This can be aimed at influencing risk drivers. For example, we can test what would happen in the Dominican Republic if we manage to lower the informal construction, the informal construction by a given percentage for the forthcoming years? And uh, we can also evaluate how efficient would be retrofitting campaigns in the municipalities with highest risk, for example. And, and, and then the funds we use for that can be a percentage of the country's GDP. Um, we can go to the next slide. And we can implement then those assumptions in our models and we can see if the targets we set are feasible or not. And here we can see that for the specific case of Santo Domingo, it is possible to decrease risk by 5% by the year 2030 through retrofitting some structures. Retrofitting in Santo Domingo is more efficient than higher code enforcement only because this municipality already has the lowest rate of informal construction in the country and because new structures are likely to be fully code complying anyways. So that's it for my presentation. I hope you liked it. I guess as a final remark or idea, I would just like a message, that message to be clear that when we evaluate risk, we are taking a snapshot of our current risk. But if we're already putting some effort into understanding what is driving our current risk, then we can also gain insights into how it may look in the future and how we can use that to propose more effective uh, risk mitigation strategies. So thank you very much. And now I would like to give the word to you, Ita. Thank you, Alejandro. So on my part of the presentation, I will be talking um, about uh, an urban risk indicator that we've been uh, working a little bit um, recently. If we go to the next slide, so um, why do we need uh, urban risk assessment? Um, you have probably seen many, many um, indicators of, 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 of different properties on different cities. For example, here we have the very famous pollution index by city, and this, these are the values from 2021. There's different indicators for the quality of life, crime, um, um, travel, different different properties. And these indicators usually are, are quite interesting for us to basically try to monitor um, um, different uh, parameters across the different cities and also to compare the values that we have from different cities. Uh, next. So on disaster risk, there's been also a few indicators for some cities. For example, in this study here that was supported by the World Bank, 
I'm only showing the, the top 30 um, cities. And this was based on, on all natural hazards, not just on earthquake. But there was an extensive study covering um, the countries that you see in, in green to try to understand how is the risk um, across these different uh, cities. Uh, next one. We also have another indicator that was developed by Swiss Re, which once again, they were evaluating um, the potential threat of different natural um, uh, hazards uh, um, across, across different cities. So um, next one. We, we can obviously come up with different risk indicators for different cities and, um, and, and how can we use them and why should we use them. Um, risk indicators, in my opinion, at least when it comes to cities, there's probably three main um, purposes. Um, one is just like I was showing for the pollution, you can monitor uh, the risk throughout time as basically um, uh, the exposure changes, maybe different code regulations, maybe retrofitting campaigns, or maybe incremental construction that is going to increase the vulnerability, but you can monitor how risk is changing um, uh, throughout time. It is also very useful for risk awareness. It's something that actually um, uh, in the last few years, we had a, a lot of requests to also try to provide some information of risk for cities, not just for countries. And it was mostly for the purposes of, of risk awareness because obviously no one is going to develop a, a, a risk mitigation strategy just based on a single indicator um, for a city. And finally, if you manage to find a way to do this risk analysis across the different cities, the different urban centers, in a more uniform manner, then it becomes um, easier for you to compare the risk across the different cities because hopefully the bias and the uncertainty is um, common to all the different cities. So perhaps you might not really understand how much is the risk, for example, for Kampala. But if I tell you that the risk is similar to um, another country where um, earthquakes have, have happened recently, it might be easier for people less familiar with concepts of risk and hazard to understand what's the risk for that city. So the first issue we had was, okay, how do we define the urban boundaries? Do I actually only consider the boundaries of the city, you know, the administrative level of that particular city? Do I consider the urban areas? Do I consider the metropolitan area of the city? Because this changes um, very significantly. Some cities have very small administrative areas, whilst other cities basically cover um, uh, wide areas. Also, the definition of metro areas and urban areas, it's completely different even within the same continent. So we needed to make sure that we're going to use something that would make sense um, for the purposes of developing an index for uh, earthquake risk assessment. So we adopted the, the, the concept of functional urban centers. This was actually something that was proposed, at least the first time that I saw, was from the Joint Research Center, um, initially for Europe, but then it was expanded to, to the rest of the world. And it's quite interesting because the boundaries for each urban center are defined based on how the urban centers work. So basically it takes into account um, where people work, where the industries are, they even took into account, for example, um, information from um, uh, cell phone towers and the traffic of people just to understand how, um, um, how, how, how are these urban centers functioning, which makes sense, right? Because if you have an earthquake, for example, close to downtown, it's certainly also going to affect the suburbs if people are working um, um, in those centers. So this is just two examples here that we have here for Kampala in Uganda and also for Mumbai in India. And you can see the, 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 the boundaries of the functional area, areas. Let's go to the next one. So the next part was um, uh, uh, how can we now define um, what's, what's the exposed value? And we have focused on population and GDP, basically to have an indicator of the people and then also an indicator of the economy. We do have information about the building stock as part of the global risk model, but the idea was to try to use something that was going to be more uniform and less biased. Uh, the building stock, the quality of the building stock, um, uh, the, the exposure model is very different uh, across different parts of the world. And this was a way for us to, to have a more fair comparison between the urban centers. So we used the World Pop, um, very well known data set. There's many, many uh, global population data sets out there. Um, this one seems to be the one that is being used um, more often and it's quite um, stable and reliable. Then we converted the population into gross domestic product by using some um, either the World Bank um, database or some local databases which have information about the GDP per capita. Next one. <clears throat> 
So then I can start um, doing some, some calculations and, and uh, past indicators, basically they have used just a single map. And in particular, they used the well-known GSHEP, which was released in 1999. Um, they either use a PGA value or a macro seismic intensity, which was basically um, converted from the PGA value. And we do have a, a new global seismic hazard map, which is comprised by 30 um, uh, uh, PSHA models. And here I'm showing the, the PGA for the 500 years return period. Let's go for the next one. However, I don't think it is a good idea for us to use um, a single value of, of, of PGA. This is because the risk, the, the, the threat that earthquakes pose um, to different um, uh, in different locations is not just governed by one return period. I'm showing here just an example of two locations in South Italy and South uh, Romania that basically they have um, exactly the same seismic hazard according to the um, um, uh, model that was developed within SHARE. They have the same hazard for a given return period, but then um, the hazard for the other return periods is very different. And this basically leads to very different risk or, or collapse risk if you assume exactly the same building in, in these two locations. This goes in line with the well-known risk target um, um, theory. So instead of, of doing that, let's go to the next one. Um, for this risk index, we used um, um, uh, an indicator, which is the part that you see over there on the integral, which takes into account all the levels of shaking associated with the rate of recurrence. So it's basically the integral of the seismic hazard curve instead of just one point on the seismic hazard curve. So this first, Indicator, okay, before we bring the confusion of vulnerability, is simply the population multiplied by this average hazard indicator. So if there's no population in a particular location, then um, obviously that cell is not contributing to the um, um, hazard index. And um, likewise, if the hazard is very low, um, this part, even if you have a lot of people or a lot of GDP on that particular location, um, it's going to contribute less to the hazard index. Uh, if we go to the next one, we have a first view of basically uh, how the index, I'm only showing here the, um, the top um, 100 um, um, urban centers. And, and on the bottom, there's also the top 15 urban centers. So probably without the great surprise, we have uh, large urban centers like Tokyo, Jakarta, Beijing, Istanbul, uh, the cluster between Osaka and Kyoto on the top of the list in terms of population. I repeat that we're not bringing the differences in vulnerability into this process yet. This is in terms of population. Let's go to the next one. And we have the results for GDP. So in this case, um, we do have a few places where the hazard index lowers, goes down a little bit, but places like Tokyo, Kyoto, uh, become um, the hazard index becomes even greater. And now we also have, for example, Los Angeles, greater Los Angeles, Los Angeles area, and also the San Francisco Bay area. As, as two areas that just pop out given the, um, the economy and how much wealth is produced in these places. But again, this is only basically um, population or GDP exposed to different levels of seismic hazard. I also want to emphasize that we're not taking just one point in terms of seismic hazard for these locations. We're taking uh, uh, thousands of points because these functional urban areas um, have um, uh, an area uh, uh, of thousands of square kilometers. So we're taking into account also variations on the hazard within this, these regions. If we go to the next one, we can also try to do something um, uh, to take into account the vulnerability. And on this case, I'm showing here the Global Human Settlements Layer, also released by the Joint Research Center. Alejandro spoke about this and also um, um, Jamal about the, the need to try to go in a different resolution. And we can look at the different cities and understand when the urban fabric was, was built, was constructed. And we have here four different epochs. And we can also go to the global risk model I was mentioning before and start to understand, okay, based on the different epochs, how much, um, how is the vulnerability from the different places? Because I know that buildings that were recently built in Tokyo are definitely going to be less vulnerable than buildings built, for example, in Port-au-Prince. So I, I, I don't have time to go into much into detail about the definition of those um, uh, factors, but let's go to the next slide. But just to show here an example, Obviously, we have countries that regardless of when they were built, the vulnerability is still going to be quite high, okay? And we have here 100%, which means that it's um, a, building, a, a building factor, vulnerability factor that is going to be very vulnerable. And then we have, for example, for Japan, the vulnerability factor is going to be much lower. This means that uh, this is based on average general losses. It means that for each 
dollar that is um, spent or, or is lost in Japan, uh, $10 are spent, for example, in 80. So now the risk index takes into account the population, the average area, but also the vulnerability index, which uh, has a different value depending when that particular part of the uh, urban fabric was built. If we go to the next one, we have now the distribution again of the urban centers across, across the world. This one in terms of population. So now we can see that some places like, for example, um, uh, certainly the Bay Area, Los Angeles, Tokyo goes down because the vulnerability is uh, obviously much lower. Um, still there and still present because the hazard is still quite high. And for example, the metro area of Tokyo is 40 million people. So um, obviously more than a lot of the countries that we have out there, the entire population of the country. If we go to the next one, in terms of the GDP, again, we also have some differences. Now we have a few places, for example, in, in Latin America that um, um, the vulnerability doesn't go down as much as in other places. And we also have places like, for example, Istanbul and Tehran, where um, the risk is slightly bigger. Next one. As um, uh, Alejandro was explaining, um, something that we are asked a lot of times and something that is actually quite common now in almost all the projects um, um, from institutions like the, like the, like the World Bank, but uh, other organizations as well, is always to have this prediction of what's going to happen in the future. Because a lot of these large plans for risk reduction, they are long term and it's the investment of a huge portion of the, the capital stock of the country. So. Um, we can use once again um, similar models like the ones that Alejandro was mentioning about uh, population and economic growth and apply this to the different urban centers to understand how the risk is expected to change in the future. If we go to the next slide, we can also make different assumptions of how the buildings are going to be in the future. So basically, do we expect a code uh, level to um, improve in the country? Or should we assume that whatever is present now in the country will continue to be like that? And this is what this is showing. So the list of countries on the left is um, the population risk index, what I showed before. And then basically throughout time, assuming that the code enforcement would remain the same, um, this is how the, the risk uh, or the list, the ranking of these urban centers is expected to change until 2050. So we have places like, for example, Tokyo, uh, uh, Mexico City, that the risk is actually expected to come down, or at least the ranking is expected to come down due to the fact that some um, more modern regulations are being enforced. But also in a lot of these places, the population is actually expected to decrease in a few decades. And in other places, the population is expected to continue increasing and code enforcement is quite um, inefficient. So the risk is expected to increase. For example, we have here Kabul in Afghanistan that was not part of this list and now it is. And then we have, for example, Mexico City that is no longer part of, of this list. So just a final slide. Um, just some um, final remarks. So urban risk indices um, is something that uh, um, it, it still can be quite useful. Again, I would say probably not as useful as the detailed risk assessment studies we've seen, uh, for example, Alejandro presenting, uh, but it's still useful for risk awareness and to do some monitoring of the risk in these urban centers, mainly because you can use a uniform approach for all the urban centers. Um, it is important to adapt the traditional approaches for risk indexing for the case of seismic risk. Uh, you know, floods could be quite localized, maybe even some of the landslides, but um, large earthquakes affect obviously um, areas well beyond the administrative limits of, of these cities. Um, it is also important to try for us to predict um, um, the growth of population and e economy in the country, because this is probably going to give us some heads up about what's going to be the, the hotspots of seismic risk. Um, in the future. And with that, I want to thank you um, for, for the invitation and for attending this talk. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, it was a super interesting, exactly, super interesting presentation. Um, so I'd like to open the floor to uh, questions uh, from the attendees. And while people, uh, yes, uh, there is a um, hand uh, from Alfredo Gonzalez. Hi, how are you? Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I have a question for Alejandro. Um, the uh, 
the land use regulations can influence the the results of your of the of the analysis of future population areas growth. Uh, for example, there is pressure on uh, buffer zones to expand when population reaches a certain level. How can that be taken into account in this type of models? Is, is that as a time dependent variable or is it a, a scenario? Or how, how is that considered? Thank you. Um, thank you, Alfredo. This is this is actually a very interesting question. Um, so in urban city regulations can be considering analysis like the ones we saw in the for the multiple agent systems. How can we do this? Basically, um, urban plan regulations will eventually become masks in, in the model. So basically what we can say is um, this area is not up for building uh, for the next 25 years. So we can program that in our model and then we can tell the agents this area has a, a value of zero for the next 25 years. And then um, after 25 years, then it's up for you to decide like if it's valuable to develop or not. So that's one way it can be uh, uh, implemented. But the other thing that it's, um, so I see that it being easily implemented in the mass models. In the Monte Carlo simulations, that's very difficult to implement. Um, I don't think like, uh, well, you could implement it, but due to the scale of the analysis, because Monte Carlo is meant for, for bigger, uh, higher scale areas. Uh, it will be differ difficult to implement all the city planning of all the cities for that for that current um, uh, for for us for a for a given country. And the last comment is that it's true, but also in Latin America, for example, uh, we have city plans, we have uh, regulations, but uh, people do not necessarily follow it. This is especially true. For example, now I'm I'm studying Quito, Santiago. I can see that uh, assuming that they will be respected, it's a long shot as well. So. That's what, that, that would be my answer. Thank you. Um, anyone else with a question? I have a question. Uh, so it seems to me um, that all across those presentations, basically, um, it's important to understand how the urban environment evolves uh, in time. So are you uh, interacting or somehow refining the model through interaction with, for example, ur urban planners or um, relevant stakeholders who can give uh, a much better and clearer idea of how uh, th that specific city will evolve in the future? And that will have an impact on the way in which you calculate the, those indexes, for example. Um, and Peter, would you like to answer? I can also talk a little bit about the experience that we had in South America. Yeah, sure, Ali. You can you can start, and then I can continue. Yeah. So in in South America, we're closing. Uh, we're we're working in close collaboration with the municipalities, and uh, one of the things we are we are working with them is to try to um, um, do these risk assessments, considering like significant scenarios. And then trying to influence the response and emergency planning, but also the urban planning uh, with the results of these uh, uh, risk assessments. For those risk assessments, what we do is we ask the city for the most detailed information they have, and we definitely uh, account it and take it into account. Um, one example, we use cadastre databases, which are very, very um, defined or very detailed, telling us, for example, in Quito, exactly what kind of constructions they are and with a very good resolution. And then we take that into account for our, for our models. We create scenarios and then we inform the, the, the stakeholders about this so we can influence their policies. And uh, you can go ahead with it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, so so yes, yeah, so uh, um, uh, that, that's, that's the bigger question, right? Well, how, how some of these results then, then can be used. So, uh, you know, I, I can tell you that a lot, a lot of the times that we've been doing some research about these topics um, was obviously within projects that were going to be applied. For example, the stuff that um, Alejandro was showing for Europe was for um, DG Echo. So hopefully a lot of those results will be used in, in um, some policy making. But I also want to say that I, I know there's a lot of people on this call which are doing you know, their master thesis, their PhD thesis. And sometimes you might not see directly where your um, research is going to be applied, 
But I think a lot of times it's just a matter of time until eventually somebody sees this and then um, uh, they might contact you, they might ask you to participate in some in some of these projects and some of these studies um, to effectively use in policy making. And, and that's something that I've seen a lot um, in, in the last years. Um, I also wanted to say that um, in this risk indexes, for, for example, what I was presenting was mostly based on um, on direct impact, right? I was not talking anything here about indirect losses or the coping capacity of, of, of the different countries. It is something that can be taken into account. There's a lot of research on the social sciences about that, and that would certainly change also the index. Um, um, you know, you, you could always do the what if scenarios, but you can integrate that already and see how the ranking of the countries um, changes. But it's just um, something that we haven't done yet. Maybe Valentina, I, I, if that's okay with you, I, I also see a question here, which is a little bit related. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, with, yeah. With what I'm saying from from Keith. Yeah. Um, so y it is obviously very important. What Keith is saying is is basically about um, how do we take into account basically the time of the event, because we've seen in the past that if if an earthquake happens during the day, during the night, um, you know, if it is during transit hours, the impact is quite different, and usually. Um, at least in Europe, for example, if the earthquake happens during the night, more people are in residential buildings, which tend to be um, which tend to be on on residential buildings tend to be a little bit more vulnerable. So the losses are a little bit higher. This is an extremely important question. For example, for scenario analysis or if somebody is doing near real time um, loss assessments, I will say, however, that on probabilistic risk, you can assume that the event can happen um, any time of the day, right? So basically, when you are simulating, for example, your thousands of years of events and you simulate thousands of, of events, eventually you're going to have events um, that happen during the night, during the day, and transit hours. So um, by doing that, you will you will obviously take into account the different times of the day um, that the event happens. Um, I know that uh, maybe Jamal, you can comment a little bit on this because I know you did this for um, for Europe. Yeah, Vitor, indeed, we are currently actually doing this uh, for Europe uh, under RISE project. We are basically looking at the exposure, which is the baseline. We take like um, the night time, which is typically used. And now we are using the night, day and transit and even seasonal uh, seasonal changes, not only in time, but also how it changes temporarily. Uh, and, and that's quite important, as uh, Vitor mentioned, for the scenario analysis. And we think that would have quite large impact. Thanks, thanks. There is also another question from Tina. Uh, based on Dr. Silva's presentation, uh, maps shown on a global scale, example, GDP seismic risk index, population risk index, etc., did not show a bubble in New Zealand or other countries along the ring of fire in Asia Pacific. Any idea, any idea where it is, this is attributed to? Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Tina. This is because of, of you know, the different magnitudes in terms of population and gross domestic product uh, between the different cities. I mean, you know, the entire country of New Zealand is less than 5 million people. Um, for example, the metro area of Lima alone is 10 million people. So, um, even if we were assuming that the entire population, for example, of, of, of New Zealand would be in Auckland, it would probably still be lower than um, the population that exists in these places. And I can tell you that when I was checking the, um, the distribution of the urban centers, I'm from Portugal, I was expecting to see Lisbon at some point, and, and it was not there. Um, I can tell you that we analyzed 9,000 urban centers. So obviously New Zealand eventually appears, um, um, it's just not on the, top 100 places um, uh, right now, uh, because obviously uh, you also have the fact that the vulnerability in, in, in places like New Zealand, for example, is lower than, um, for example, in places in Southeast Asia and in some places in Latin America. But uh, it is there, it's just not on the top 100 for now. Related to that, is the Philippines included? The Philippines is included, it's Quezon City, it's Manila. It was on the, um, okay, on the, okay. top, on the top 15 countries. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Uh, Camilo Gomez? Yeah, 
Um, hi, everybody. Hi, Vitor, Jamal, and, and Alejo. Thank you for your very nice uh, presentation. So just for curiosity, uh, Vitor, in, it's very interesting what you're showing. Uh, but I was wondering, for instance, on existing works uh, like the one from Schlecke and Sandermann in, from Swiss Re, I mean, have you done any comparison with that? Because for me, it was a bit weird finding uh, cities uh, as San Jose that are not displayed in there. Because, for instance, uh, is ranked as the first one, Lima as the second one, uh, in terms of the value of working days lost relative to the national economy due to earthquakes. So it's, um, I mean, are you planning to do so, some comparison of to improve or to integrate uh, your results in such models? Thank you, Camilo. So yes, uh, we did study a little bit the uh, uh, the approach by, by, for example, for, for Swiss Re. It's a little bit different, you know, the other indicators that we see out there. For example, the one I was talking about, the World Bank, um, was mostly based on the NMMI value, single value that was taken from the PGA map of GSHEP, calculated on ROC with a conversion equation. So, you know, there's a lot of uncertainties there. For the, per, for the Swiss Re, basically there's um, two parts on, on that study, which is extremely interesting. I recommend people to, to take a look at it. Um, one part was basically just checking the exposed population to um, um, uh, to different levels of seismic hazard, which so very similar to what I was presenting previously, but uh, anchored to the one return period. Then when they moved to to you know the, the working days that were lost, this was based on, on single events. So it's no longer probabilistic risk. And a lot of times um, it, it was based on, let's say, worst case scenario events or, or basically recorded events in the past. So whilst it is quite um, useful, and, and I like that methodology very much uh, about you know, estimating the economic losses based on the lost working days, I would say that in order to make the comparison fair between the different countries, we do need to go to the probabilistic approach because otherwise, you know, maybe there are some urban centers that just did not experience a strong event yet, and we would be missing that out. So this is why um, we do have some changes, some variations, some differences between Swiss Re and, uh, and the results that I showed here. Okay, thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, Camilo. Anyone else? Seems the questions have um, finished. So, uh, in, in that case, I would really like to thank um, all the speakers for the super interesting presentation, uh, all the people who have attended and asked questions. Um, and the recording will be um, soon available. So, the people interested can email me um, and I can forward the link. Uh, so, thank you very much again. Um, and I hope to see you soon, uh, well, in person uh, somehow. And uh, I wish you a nice rest of the of the afternoon. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you, Have Valentina. Nice Bye. Bye. Bye.